What's up, Foot Clan? As we all get excited for the NFL draft that is fast approaching, that also means fantasy football is approaching and you can still get in on the Ultimate Draft Kit for the lowest possible price. Head over to ultimatedraftkit.com. This is what we spend the entire offseason building up, 100-plus video profiles, our tiered rankings, everything you need to know to get ready for the draft, including the app that just gets sexier and sexier by the day. Get in on it. Lowest possible price right now, ultimatedraftkit.com. Hey, what's up? This is Justice Hill from the Baltimore Ravens, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. So excited to be with you, the Fantasy Footballers, Thursday, April 9th. Andy, Mike, and Jason. Uh, We got a wonderful wide receiver show today. Oh, killer alliteration. Thank you, Mike. I'm glad you noticed. noticed. I did not notice. That, That was well done, both of you. Quarantine check. How you guys doing? Any new developments uh, in the you know half acres, quarter acres that you're currently allowed to live inside of? <laughs> I've started to give myself a ten thirty a.m. deadline for brushing my teeth. That's really oh, what. Wow. I, oh I mean, wow! It's just one of those things where it's got it's got to happen. You got to have a deadline, <laughs> or the day gets away from you, and next thing you know, you go. It's four p.m. And there's a pro- there's yep. a problem, and so and and so you know we're we're all about finding problems and fixing them. Problem fixed. Yeah, that takes a psychological toll when you have to brush your teeth at four in the afternoon and just you don't feel say, good about yourself. You just lost. I can't the day. believe you still do it at four p.m. I'm I'm throwing the hat in on that one. Is eh, I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> That's when I just go to sleep. I say, sure. well, I'm I'm this far gone. Good night, Napsky. Yes. I celebrated my 14th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Oh, congrats. and uh we we celebrated by staying home. And okay. <laughs> That's that sounds cool. Now man. I saw I saw an Instagram story, Mike. Uh you can follow all of us, by the way. Uh Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. Mike is at FF Hitman, Jason at Jason FFL. I'm at Andy Holloway. But I saw a, a post. Now you you did not go and purchase a bouquet for your wife. You picked a bouquet for your I wife. I did. I Now where did you find said pickable flowers? My backyard. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Look, man, you gotta use the resources you got. So I grabbed the scissors, I headed out, and I made us made myself a bouquet. I'm I think uh, I speak for the Foot Clan when I say I'm most impressed that you have a bunch of flowers in yeah, your backyard. Yeah, me too. That's I was surprised. Look, I are you, those, ru- you ruined those, her garden. Her whole those, garden is torn out. Like weeds that had c- cropped up. Got a bunch of dandelions in your bouquet. Hey, what they count, right? Yeah, you're not in quarantine. <laughs> it always counts. <laughs> All right, here's the quick question of the day. By the way, a quick reminder as well. A live AMA. We're doing it on the forums this Friday, April 10th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. You can navigate yourself over there by going to footclanhelp.com. Jason is committed to answering every question over there. Thoughtless. So he's making a a face right now as though he regrets that commitment on Tuesday maybe, but we'll see. Footclanhelp.com, post the question. I dare say he doesn't remember saying that. No, I remember. I have mild regret. But, the, I mean, (laughs) look, I here's the thing. I don't have all that much going on. So wait a minute. You're available. Wait a minute. When is, when is it? What, what day? Friday. You do have. Yeah, I know you have. Stuff oh going no, on. that's April tenth. That's Final Fantasy Seven remake. <laughs> Abandoned ship. I won't Sucker. be there. <laughs> the Foot, go to is fo- go to footclannohelp.com. <laughs> I'll be watching trolls. I will yeah. be playing Final Fantasy. I will be singing Hamilton live. And Hamilton, yes. April 10th is a big day. We've got no more questions. The AMA and all of those events. So footclanhelp.com, check it out. Quick question of the day. What is Devin Singletary's ceiling for 2020? 
Go ahead, Jay. When when I heard when I saw this question, I I basically just saw like what is Devin Singletary? Because if you talk about what his ceiling is, I think his ceiling is much higher than the probability that he could actually achieve it. He is a very good back. Uh, you know, he averaged over five yards a carry. He looked electric on the field, but he's got a little bit of the Philip Lindsay syndrome where what's going to happen with him. And you saw this the second half of the year. Yes, Frank Gore was there, but he was the workhorse back. I mean, he was getting 15 plus carries game in and game out. But if he doesn't get touchdowns, you end up with a really efficient, productive day with a lot of volume and he's got 70 yards on the ground and it doesn't feel good in fantasy when you get your seven fantasy points. And, you know, so the thing is, is it's about touchdowns to me. That's that's going to be the differentiator as to whether or not his ceiling is reached because he's a good back who looks like he's going to have at least the lion's share, assuming they bring in another uh, back. But they did not use him inside the 10 yard line that just wasn't I th I think this is from memory I think he had three carries inside the 10 all season and you know if, if he ends, if he ends up with a handful of touchdowns you know four five touchdowns you're going to be really disappointed now if that changes where inside the five they start giving him the work and I don't think they will because he's a 200 pound back then his his ceiling changes to like, you know, low end RB one, like a RB 12. I just don't think he gets there. What's crazy to me is looking through the numbers and trying to remember because he was so shifty. Like, I mean, he is, he's a little bit smaller, but tied for the fourth most runs of over 15 yards, despite being 28th in rushing attempts. But then you look what happened to him in the passing game. Like it's absolute insanity. <laughs> The, the inefficiency where they'll hear the final games. One reception for two yards. Two receptions for two yards. One reception for four yards. Like, like how is that possibly happening to Devin Singletary? That's so weird. That's called giving him the ball right before he gets tackled. That's, that's, ah, that's it. called a bad decision. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're right, Jason, about the fact that his ceiling is very high if he can find his way into the end zone. I love the bills and the prospects of them having a very good offense for you know this upcoming season the opportunity for them to be a playoff bound division winning type of team but it will just come down to the fact that much like Miles Sanders Josh Jacobs does the team trust him enough to put him on the field on in important situations do they pass him the ball enough because i think he's you know we saw his screen game capability so if that increased I think you would see more and more big plays because he's so explosive but I think he's a top 20 back I don't know if this is a top 10 type of season for Devin Singletary whereas they, I could see top 10 from you know I could see things working out for Miles Sanders and Josh Jacobs into the top 10 like the Bills they traded all their picks basically for Stefan Diggs so do you uh, one do you guys see them spending a pick that they have left on a running back. And if not, then Jason, I mean, you were talking about his, his build. TJ Yeldon is still there. And TJ Yeldon is a larger guy. Like TJ Yeldon's a 220 pound running back. You feel like he's going to slip in here when, uh, for the, the goal line carries like Frank Gore had. No, I, I don't think so. I think that if it stays status quo, Singletary will get the opportunity. It's funny. In my college scouting last year on Singletary, I remember thinking if people would use him as a goal line back, I think he'll be very successful because he usually makes the first guy miss. If you just need a couple of yards to get in, he's very shifty, but people get very uh, pigeonholed into the big, strong back that can just move the pile two yards. Um, yeah, I like the Danny said, Woodhead on the goal line. Give me yeah, that. Exa exactly. But the, the reality is they still have seven picks. Um, you know, they traded their first, but they've got, uh, you know, I think a couple of twos or they've ha they have plenty of capital to get a running back. And I fully okay. expect them to get a bigger bodied running back as a Frank Gore replacement. In this I, draft. I don't think they'll pick one up in the draft. I think they'll get one through free agency and you'll end up with a similar situation. Gore has a certain level of goal line respect that he has achieved for whatever reason. But um, I think we're all saying the same thing. I think Singletary is a very talented back. It'll come down to opportunity and touchdowns. Do you guys see Hard Knocks is going to be both the Rams and the Chargers this year, by the way? I did. It's very interesting. 
I assume this is new stadium related. Well, they're petitioning to combine the teams as well, just into <laughs> one one record, uh, combined who, rosters. Who instigated this? Was it the Chargers? Yeah, uh, yes, it was the Char- It was it was both teams. Both teams need some help, maybe. Yeah, but, but we don't uh, get Jeff Fisher this time. Yeah, I know. We don't get the speech. I'm not going seven and nine. I'm not oh, going eight and eight. Yeah, we got on that show. We got on that hard. Oh knocks. yeah, we did. No, Remember? no, no, no. We were on the Amazon show. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought we got on. To, I thought we were on. I the thought hard we were on hard well. knocks. Was it hard yeah. knocks? I think yeah, it was. They, it was. I think they put a clip of me bashing Jeff Fisher. Yeah, when, they did. They did. They had Jason featured bashing Jeff Fisher. We'll have our then, people look into it. And then Jason yeah. ended up following that up by dressing up as Jeff Fisher for Halloween. <laughs> Yeah, baby. So uh, what else is going on? Uh, we know that the NFL is going to be doing a very interesting, potentially <laughs> technologically challenged draft, but we're all looking forward to it. Uh, you guys just want to jump into the wideouts? Yep. Wide receivers. All right. We just did two episodes. Our early running back consensus rankings. It was a lot of fun. We're jumping into the wide receivers now. Number one is Michael Thomas. Shocking. Shocking, <laughs> right? I I uh I think we know what Michael Thomas managed to do last year, break the all-time receptions record, 149 receptions, 1,725 yards, nine touchdowns, 185 targets. Yeah, it's ridiculous. He was uh incredibly consistent and he did it in a season in which he did not have Drew Brees for the full duration, which is incredible. Uh, and he was still great with Teddy. Yeah, he was. He, was. he wasn't he was the same level, but he was good. And we've heard that stat that, you know, Michael Thomas would have outscored Odell Beckham Jr. if you only counted his home games. That's how good of a season Michael Thomas had. But I did, I did want to go look at the previous reception leader, Marvin Harrison, and his special season, because I was curious about where Harrison went after that point. Sure, we have we've and and it seemed familiar to me in the sense that we've seen the fifty touchdown years from whether it's Mahomes, Peyton, Brady, and then you know these are very special seasons, but the record breaking seasons. And last year, you saw targets for Michael Thomas jump from one hundred and forty nine, one hundred and forty seven to one eighty five. So that's a very significant jump. And then I look back at Marvin Harrison's record-breaking year. He had 205 targets that season, which is incredible, 143 receptions. But he dropped from 142 receptions down to 94 the next year, and he actually never, despite having another 10 years or whatever it was, he actually never broke the 100 catch mark again. And I'm not saying that Michael Thomas is going to imitate that, but that's more of you know, not a reflection on the talent, but just on the reality of breaking records, special seasons. We know his catch rate is ridiculous. He's been <laughs> at eighty two point five percent averaged over the last two years with Breeze, and I don't expect that to change at all with yeah, Bree- with Breeze back. Over the last two years, that's the highest catch percentage of of any wide receiver with over a hundred receptions. I looked at the same thing, Andy, because I wanted to see if there was any trends we could yeah. we could glean from that. But there are guys like Antonio Brown, Julio Jones. You can want to go back even a little bit further, like Chris Carter. Guys sustain their their high level of receptions. It happens, and I, so I was trying to figure out, okay, how does it how is it possible if Michael Thomas doesn't hit that mark? Let's let's try and be the devil's advocate at least. And the question is brought up of Emmanuel Sanders is now on the team. What does he do to this offense? How many targets does he absorb coming in? Because as soon as he was traded to San Francisco, he took 27% of their targets. Now, a very different team, but I'm saying Sanders was traded in the middle of the season, and that was the, that was the target share that he commanded. Now, on the Saints, last year, Michael Thomas was insane. Alvin Kamara, near 100 targets, and Kamara will be there again. It's the third option. Last year, it was Jared Kuk who had 11% of the targets. Still, still funny, by the way. <laughs> it, yes. It, it's really hard to give it. I don't like, understand what's J- funny. J- Jason is the best at throwing it out and moving away. Jared on face. Jared Kuke. Uh So 11% of the targets. Two years ago, when Michael Thomas was still insane, 
Ben Watson was the third option, 9%. So yeah. th- that's what that's what Michael Thomas has had to deal with. Alvin Kamara and then tight ends who are getting about 10% of the uh, 10% of the market share. What happens if Emmanuel Sanders goes in and he's at 15%? I mean, that's that, then Michael that will do Thomas is still a, he's still a top 5 wide receiver. <laughs> that's yeah, that's certainly. the answer. But the odds of repeating are very low a season like this. Without yeah, question. I, I, I looked to move him down because I don't believe necessarily that he'll be the number one, but because this is the early wide receiver ranking show, I felt like it. he deserved it. After the season he had and, you know, really Emmanuel Sanders being the only one to come in here and, and cause problems. Now, when we stat everybody out for the ultimate draft kit and we actually break down well, how many targets will Emmanuel Sanders have? How many passes is Drew Brees going to be able to throw? And and what does this you know what does this mean for Michael Thomas? I'll bet he doesn't end up as my number one. But this was honorary because he just had a historic season. And if you were to take him number one overall at, at wide receiver, not number one in the draft, but the first wide receiver off the board, I don't think you're going to be disappointed because his baseline sure. is so high. His you know you talked about his catch rate, uh, Andy, just being astronomical, but of his 180 targets, 155 were deemed catchable. So his true catch rate was 96. percent I mean, he's he's a he's absurdly he's good. great. He's good. Yeah, solid point. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day, what I wanted to ask this question before we move on: what are what's the percentage odds you would give him finishing at number one? Because I know that you know the variability, other receivers stepping up. Is this a you know is this a fifty fifty uh, shot for you? Is this no? That's way much too lower. High. Okay. Yeah, it, it's it's in the twenties, just because I think there's easily five players that could finish number one. So you know if you say what's the percentage chance of the next few we're going to talk about finishing number one, it's pro- probably near the twenties. And yeah. my my last point here, which it, against Michael Thomas, Drew Brees was passing at a rate that we haven't seen. In a long time, like his actual 16 game pace was 597 attempts. To put that in context, two years ago it was 489, before that, 536. So Breeze was just having to throw the ball a whole lot, a whole lot more. So we'll see if that continues or not. The nice thing is, is that his record breaking statistical performance last year was in a more predictable category. What we've seen from Michael Thomas for multiple years high catch rate, low right. yards per reception. It wasn't on the basis of a 17 touchdown type of season. Like he had nine, and I, I probably wouldn't bet on him having fewer than nine touchdowns again this year. That seems reasonable, even if Kamara runs in a few more, whatever right. the case may be. Uh, number two, we actually have Julio Jones. Julio Jones oh, no. is our consensus number two wide receiver. But, but Andy, isn't he oh, getting old? No. Yeah, I mean, we are all getting old, Jason. <laughs> mm. We're all getting older. <laughs> We, I, I didn't ask that question. Why are you yeah, responding that was the, to me? That was the public opinion. Oh, I, I'm sorry. You. Yes. Uh, Jason has him at two. Mike and I have him at number three. He's averaged 161.7 targets over the last six seasons. I don't know if we need to tell you about Julio Jones. I think we need to talk about whether this continues on the basis of that inquiry from the voice of public opinion, which is... You know, is there any cause for concern, regression, those type of things? I don't think so this year. No, I mean, he. I mean, it's just a matter of when he falls off. You know, at some point, every receiver is going to fall off, including Julio Jones. Is that this season or is it not? And I don't believe it is. Nothing on the field seemed like it last year. He's got the big money contract. They need him now as much as ever. They lost Austin Hooper. And yeah, in the, in the two games without Hooper, Julio had down uh, performances in fantasy this last year, but that's not that's not predictive in the slightest. I mean, this is a team that really needs him to be great. He looked great. They're paying him to be great. Uh, you know, I, I still think you're going to get the same old Julio, and so when I put him number two, I just uh, I, I think you're going to get more of the same of the last four years, which is a top five wide receiver guaranteed. Yeah, I, I that's what I was going to throw out is I haven't seen anything from Julio that I expect his – uh, that the play will fall off. And Austin Hooper was responsible for 14% of the targets, even with all the games that he missed. So is it possible that we see Julio Jones back at the 170 target range again? And I think that's in the range of outcomes. This isn't just uh, Hooper's 
all of Hooper's targets are going to Hayden Hurst, like lock that in. Like Julio could actually see even more volume than he had than he did last year, which is because he's done it before. Is it, it's just insane to think about yeah. the things that he has accomplished. Julio Jones since 2015 has finished as the wide receiver two, six, five, five, and three. He is he's just as consistent as it comes. We lament he's also the not he's not getting hurt anymore. We well, I know that's been the he's, refrain. He, he's getting hurt. He just is playing. Okay, right. but that's fine. I I'm cool with that. If you right. if you finish at five five and three, and then you're quote unquote getting hurt, and he's missed one game in three seasons. I mean, that's not. We don't have to go to the same song and dance with Julio that we have in the past. He may limp his way out there, but he's limping his way to wide receiver five five and three. Is all I'm saying. All right, let's go ahead and jump into. Uh, our third wide receiver here. Before we do that, I want to thank today's sponsor. Oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful friend of my family. Hey, That's Hello Fresh mouth-watering seasonal recipes, pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with Hello Fresh, America's number one meal kit. They make cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. And we were kind of talking about this before the show. It's just been great getting the Hello Fresh. We do it three times a week, and it's some variety. It's fresh produce. It's fresh uh, ingredients. It's something different than I can't have peanut butter and honey every single time. Let's say there's there's only so many chicken nuggets a man can eat. That's what I'm saying. And they, they <laughs> cut out all that stress that comes with meal planning because the other side of the coin is I've got to figure all that stuff out and go shop for it. Not the case with HelloFresh. They cut all that stress out. You can enjoy uh, cooking, getting dinner on the table in 30 minutes or less, maybe even 20 minutes for some of their quicker recipe options. And there is something for everybody. You got low calorie meals, vegetarian, family friendly recipes. Our kids eat it. That's that's not a foregone conclusion with most meals, but our kids really, really enjoy it. And they can help you eat more sustainably as well. To learn more about HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com. Very easy. HelloFresh.com. All right. I want to talk about uh, number three here. Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams. Last year, marred by injury. Yeah. Not the only time that's happened to Devontae Adams. He actually hasn't played a full season in quite a while. Missed games in three straight years. Has been great on a per-game basis. I think... There is no doubting the talent and ability of Devontae Adams being the number one target for Aaron Rodgers. You know, you talk about the identity of the Packers transforming a little bit. Aaron Jones's big year, but pass attempts have been at the same level for Aaron Rodgers for the last three years. So, you know, I think we all acknowledge Adams is a great receiver, but will he stay healthy for a full season or will he, you know, and that's a tough thing to predict. Yeah, it, it is hard to predict, but I think there are certain types of injuries that are scarier than others, um, and I, I'm not really scared off of Devontae Adams' injury history. You know, you say he's missed some games, or uh, you know, it's been a couple of years since he's played a full 16. Well, he played 14 and 15 in 2017 and 2018. Yeah, the Julio those, season. The old Julio <laughs> season. Exactly, and in those seasons, he still finished 14 and 3rd. Um, overall, he's a guy who's clearly a touchdown machine with Aaron Rodgers. Those first couple of weeks in the new uh, LaFleur system, Devontae Adams wasn't as involved. I remember week one, week three, people were thinking, oh, no, Devontae Adams is toast. From that point on, the rest of the season on a per-game basis, because he missed a chunk of games in the middle, he was still the wide receiver three uh, in a points-per-game basis. So he was he was the same Devontae Adams that was dominating – um, in 2018, in 2019, I, I think he has as good a chance as anyone else of finishing, you know, as the number one wide receiver. Obviously, he would need to play 16 games for that, but I'm not, I'm just not scared of his specific injury history. I'm not either. I'm all in. I'm back in on Devontae Adams. Uh, he's, he's still the number one option. He had double digit targets in eight of the 12 regular season games that he played. Both playoff games for the Packers, he had double digit targets. Like he is the man. And and when he was on the field, he was, still was producing. There's like if there is a dip on Devontae Adams, I'm I'm happily buying that. And it's 
like you, I'm just thinking it back, you know, when when we're researching all these things, remembering what happened because I had Devonta Adams in our league of record, and it was it it felt mostly bad, but that's because week one, which leaves a huge huge sting on your back. If someone comes out and they have a bad week one, you feel that for for a lot of the season. Then the first game back from the injury after missing a whole bunch of games where he was injured, he was bad when he came back that first game. So that also felt bad. So there's just like these narrative things that I think will leave lasting fantasy burns on some players, which could cause Adams to drop a little bit where I think where I think he belongs. Like I have Adams as my number two wide receiver right now. Yeah, I I think that we've spent a lot of time on this show talking about the Packers offense, Matt LaFleur, Aaron Rodgers and his transformation. He's not the same fantasy producer that he used to be. And well, he those, will be now. They got Funchess. Sure. Yeah. But Adams fits into that category to me of being that target hog of when Evans was alone in Tampa Bay to an extent. And we've seen you know, I think they'd love to have more options than Devontae Adams for Aaron Rodgers. And I think some of the variability of these games where Aaron Rodgers can disappear and they can still win brings a wider range of outcomes to Adams' potential fantasy output than years past, right? Because he did, you know, you mentioned week one, he finished 67th. He also had week three where he was 51st at the position. He had yeah. week 14 at 50 two at the position. Those are not what you saw from Adams in 2018. So I think because of the transformation of the offense, you have a little bit of a wider range of outcomes. But when a guy is getting that level of target share, he's pretty safe for your offense. And last year, uh, I know he missed a bunch of games, only had the five touchdowns. Generally, you can count on him for a lot more than that over the course of a full season. He was a so, double-digit touchdown guy three straight years before he got hurt last year. And, yeah. and if you think about, we've talked a lot about the Packers offense in relation to the unsustainability of Aaron Jones' touchdown rate. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not that touchdowns are just going to go away and the Packers are going to be a bad team. It's that, oh, they might not all go to Aaron Jones next season. And so, yeah, I, I think Devontae Adams, you know, I, I, I will certainly be statting him out for double-digit touchdowns again. All right, number four on our consensus wide receiver rankings is Tyreek Hill of the Kansas City Chiefs. Number one overall fantasy wide receiver in 2018. Last year, injured, banged up, disappeared at times, didn't get the 50 touchdown season for Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes was injured. Uh, you did get to see a little peak at that same Tyreek Hill for a, in a five-week span from week six through ten where he was the number one fantasy wide receiver by way of points, number two in points per game in that span. Uh, you know, he's 26 years old. He's on the best offense in football, and there's a level of consistency with Tyreek Hill being a part of the Andy Reid offense, them returning 10 of 11 starters. I like that, and that's kind of why I have him statted where I do. I expect a great season from Tyreek. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not sure exactly what to do with, with Tyreek Hill because it would – he can be an absolute game breaker. We've seen that he can dominate for fantasy football. the The hard part for me with Tyreek Hill is that after he came back, you know, he had the injury injury problem, and he exploded. He was having monster games, but the Kansas City defense wasn't as good. And then the second half, that defense started to lock things down, and that's when Tyreek Hill was averaging basically sixty yards a game. And I mean, and that continued all the way up until the Super Bowl is when you finally had finally saw Hill have a game over 100 yards, breaking out of that 60 to 70 range. So I, while I am happy to have Tyreek as my number one wide receiver, he he won't be my first choice. I hope I'm making sense. Like if, if when I have if I've got Adams and Julio on the board, I'm not even considering taking Tyreek He doesn't there. fit the avatar for your wide receiver one that you prefer for your team. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? By the, Because he's less consistent than other receivers, he has big blow-up games, but he doesn't have the same target totals? Right. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point with their defense locking things down, them not necessarily needing to always score at will. And, and you know, some of the things we saw last year during that stretch, those, those final seven games were rough for Tyreek in fantasy yeah. that was when he was healthy and back out there on the field and during those final seven games he was the wide receiver 41 uh but if I had to bet whether or not he's going to be uh you know 
game script it out because every now and then you just have, oh, okay, Sammy Watkins got a 80-yard touchdown pass. Well, the drive's over. Nobody else gets fantasy points. Those things happen on the Chiefs. But if I had to bet whether or not Tyreek Hill stays very inconsistent like he was this last year, big blow-up games, big disappearing acts, or is like he was the previous two seasons where, you know, I mean, o- over the, the, you know, those years, what was he, wide receiver four in 2017, wide receiver one in 2018, I'm going to take his upside. Uh, I would, I, I do agree. That. Yes, I do agree with Mike that he is. Uh, I think you said it well. Like I would be super happy with Tyreek Hill as my wide receiver one, but I'm not going to take him over the guys who are such the clear and only option on their team. Uh, the same way some of those guys we've talked, you know, Julio, uh, the the other three guys, they're the clear number one with a really distant number two. And here you've got Kelsey as a good option and uh, plenty of other speedsters who can just end a drive in a minute. Yeah, it's a fair discussion. Uh, You know, I haven't ranked it too because that's where I think he'll finish fantasy-wise. But from a preferential standpoint, if you want to go with one of the bigger target, higher reception total guys, I get it. Um, Tyreek had a very significant injury last year. And even though he came back from the injury, we all saw him go. Jason, you had him on your roster. We saw him go down multiple times where you thought, oh, no, he re-injured the same thing or limps off. You know, he kind of gets carried off the field and you're like, oh, he's done. And then he's back. So uh, the offseason should do him well in that regard. And that'll help get him out there to begin next year. Number five is DeAndre Hopkins of the Arizona Cardinals. (laughs) We hope. Oh, get out of here. (laughs) Hope. It's it's done. All you people. Oh, the physical hasn't happened. Hopkins is on the Cardinals. Like, l- just let it happen. Uh, yeah, he is. Let he it is. wash over you. He's finished as the wide receiver one, wide receiver two, and wide receiver five over the last three years with 174, 163, and 150 targets. I wanted to look at the passing volume of Houston and Arizona last year. They were both middle of the pack in terms of pass attempts per game, and they were actually back to back. So, very similar. You know, Cliff Kingsbury came in and increased what Arizona did on offense tremendously. But, you know, trying to find, you know, a way to predict what Hopkins is going to do transitioning to Kyler Murray, where did you guys end up? Yeah, for me, it was one of those things where initially you come over to the Arizona Cardinals, you assume he's not going to have the same target volume that he's had. And he's had that target volume, not just with Deshaun Watson, but with like 150 quarterbacks in his short career. Because Was Brandon, was Brandon Whedon part of that equation? Everybody was part of that equation. <laughs> um, and and it's Case lo, Keenum. lo and behold, when a quarterback is there, they say, that guy's good. I'm throwing him the ball. And if you really compare Christian Kirk and Larry Fitzgerald uh, to the options at, you know, two and three that Houston had, it, it wasn't always healthy, but Will Fuller, I mean, who's, who's the better wide receiver? Will Fuller, current Larry Fitzgerald, current Christian Kirk. Uh, th- there's a discussion to be had. Sure. I think Kirk, and, Ful- Kirk and Fuller are probably not too different. Right. Um, yeah. and, and, and Kenny Stills there. So I, I do think that Hopkins will retain his large market share in a good offense with a quarterback who, you know, was already, I, I believe the quarterback eight in fantasy this last season as a rookie will certainly go up in the touchdown category. Um, I've got him a little lower than you two have him, but I still think he's a top half wide receiver one. Mike, 150 targets over under this year for Hopkins. That's what he had last year yeah. in 15 games. It's also the number he's he's never he hasn't seen fewer than 150 targets since 2015, and you saw in Arizona Larry was over 100, Kirk was over 100. I don't think that Hopkins can get to the 150 target area. Like he will be the the alpha of the wide receivers for Arizona, and I'm betting on the talent. And I, I think that some efficiency things can can happen between Kyler, who's very accurate, and Hopkins. But he he won't be seeing 150 targets. If you set the threshold, let's say over under 130, I think that's more in the line of of it would be tough to make that call. There have there have been you know we talk a lot about wide receivers switching teams, free agency versus trades. One name that did pop into my head when you look at upper upper echelon performances changing teams was what Brandon Marshall did a handful of times 
Marshall went from Denver to Miami, followed up 154 targets with 146. He was obviously the alpha. When he went from Miami to Chicago, he jumped up 50 targets from 141 to 192. Uh, he jumped up from Chicago to New York from 106 to 173. I think we all agree in a very unbiased fashion with every fantasy owner out there. We acknowledge that Hopkins is a target hog. He's going to demand the ball. 140, 150 targets, I think, is what you can expect from him. He finishes the wide receiver. You have him up there? You, you 140 to 150? 150. Yeah, I think okay. he can get close to it. But last year, he finished at wide receiver five with seven touchdowns on 150 targets in 15 games. So pu putting him at the five, six, seven range feels like a very safe, conservative ranking, considering this was the wide receiver one and the wide receiver two in back-to-back -back years with higher target totals. Yeah, that was on the, the back of double-digit touchdowns as well. I don't think he'll have that in Arizona year one with Kyler Murray. So I, I think where we've got him here in in that five to seven range is perfect. Chris Godwin comes in at number six. Godwin last year, first six weeks, best fantasy wide receiver out there, finished the year as the wide receiver two overall. Uh, you know, it would be easy to kind of glance at his consistency and say, well, his, his second half wasn't quite as good as his first half, but his second half was still really great. His first half was just unconscious. His, his mean, first half was good enough that he still finished as the wide receiver too. Yeah, he like was, the, His big games were that big. 24.2 fantasy points per game through the first six weeks. That's an 115 reception pace. It dropped down to an 86 reception pace over the second half of the year, and he was like 16 point something points per game. But he was obviously dominant. Now, it's rare, though, to have a brand new quarterback coming in to the system. And you look at what Tampa Bay did last year. They threw the ball uh, almost 40 times a game. That was fourth most in football. Do we really expect Tampa to throw the ball that much again this year? And do you expect Godwin to deliver uh, the same type of season? No, I, I think they're going to throw the ball less. I believe that they will have fewer passing yards total than they had with Jameis. They're going to be a better team, though, and maybe a few more goal line opportunities. Um, so to me, I you know, I obviously none of us have him up in, as the wide receiver, too. But he is in that slot role that was so coveted. You know, going into last year, it was all this hype of the Bruce Arian system and how he utilizes that slot wide receiver. Well, guess what? That came true. Guess what else? Tom Brady loves him. Uh, uh, you know, a Julian Edelman, Wes Welker type, who's a great route runner, can just catch every ball that he puts on the money. And so I, I think Chris Godwin's going to be an excellent wide receiver next year. If the touchdowns could go up a little while the yardage comes down a little, maybe he will finish about the same. I, you know, I, I took him down a few rungs here, but I, I would be happy with him as my wide receiver one. What if, I mean, we agree that Tom Brady will not have – infinite playing days, right? He'll be 43 when this season starts. So I don't, I don't think I can agree to that. <laughs> I don't know what deals with the devil this man has made. He had, he had his worst statistical season in a while last year. Yes, he so did. So is, is there the possibility, and I don't want to put the fear of God into all Buccaneers fans with those new uniforms. I know they're expecting big things. But one of these years... The wheels are going to fall off the Tom Brady mobile. And that variability, uh, it, it, does it factor into how you look at their pass catching options or do you just you bank on the past when you look at a 43-year-old Tom Brady? Oof. Yeah. And That's we, the we challenge. Know, we know one person who wanted off the or, – or I should say didn't necessarily want off the mobile but didn't really try to keep his ticket, <laughs> which – which is Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots. I mean, I know Ooh, they. Yeah. I know that Tom Brady's like, well, you know, I, I'm moving on. I don't care about legacy, blah blah blah. But, but if if Belichick believed that Tom Brady was 100 percent the answer, Tom Brady would be on the Patriots. That that's what I believe. So maybe we buy into that. I think Brady has enough left, and it's such a good offense uh, that Bruce Arians crafts for for fantasy players. That I'm I'm with Jason that Chris Godwin, I would be very happy to have him as my number one wide receiver. Do you get uh do you still remember noodle armed uh Peyton Manning's final oh, 
His final season. Oh, Peyton Manning. That was winning. painful, man. When it After a 39 off. touchdown season, puts up nine, oh, nine he, touchdowns in 2015. He is the poster child for when it ends, it ends. He was so unbelievably bad. I think he tied for the most interceptions that year despite not playing a large chunk of the season, and he also is the that reason. That was rough. Nine touchdowns, 17 picks. Go on. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, <laughs> Nine touchdowns, <laughs> 17 Dude, I forgot picks. it was that bad. Oh, oh man. And I don't – look, it, I think you guys are both right. I think Brady's got another season. You didn't see, you know um, – you know, I brought up Frank, Frank Reich scouting him, liking what he saw in film. But it will – I mean, it is going to happen at some point. Right. And it's going to be intense pain for all of the fantasy owners of all his weapons when it happens. That's all I'm saying. Oh, for sure. You've got to value the risk in your draft. Um, I, you know, I, I guess it's it's very narrative-y, which is not where we usually want to live, but I have a hard oh, time believing. Oh, it's a believing. great place to be. Yeah, Narrative have, Street is fun. <laughs> well, it's, fu it's certainly it's great fun. great shops. But I just have a hard time believing that Tom Brady will change teams and go to a new team and not do anything everything imaginable to be great at least this year and it's hard to bet against the goat um so you're talking I'm, about getting a new birth certificate <laughs> i see what you're saying i you know i obviously it will end at some point and it will be bad maybe he tom brady won't. is now 39 years old <laughs> right something has something has happened i mean uh, when when peyton went bad he made brock osweiler a lot of money because yeah, brock, lo brock looked so good it's like what's what? what's his name again <laughs> Brock Osweiler? <laughs> okay. All right. I just wanted to hear just it confirming. again. Just confirming. Oh, All right. Wilder. Number seven. Oh. oh, yeah. So smooth. I find myself falling more and more and more in love with Kenny G. Yep. Especially on that note. Oh, listen not that sustain? Last year, Ooh. Kenny Galladay, 65 for 11, 90, and 11, which I believe was tied for the league lead in pass-catching touchdowns. There were only two wide receivers with double-digit touchdowns last year, three pass-catchers. It was a very down year Yeah, well, Mark Andrews, touchdowns. Kenny Galladay, and who was the other receiver? That is a great question. I believe it is <laughs> Cooper Cup. I will look I'm that Ron up. Burgundy. I'm Ron Burgundy. I think you might be right. Mike and I have Kenny Galladay at seven. Jason has him at nine. Last year, he didn't have Matthew Stafford for the entire season. Still finishes the wide receiver six, which you kind of just shake your head at him overcoming that situation. David Blau? David, yeah. <laughs> Blau! Uh, st with Stafford, he was on a 70 for 1280 and 14 pace. Without Stafford... 60 for 1,108, so he really didn't lose much off of That's it. That's amazing. It just was remember, an offense that didn't get closer to the red zone as often. If you remember the specific games, though, when he didn't have Stafford, so much of it, I, I mean, obviously... Hit, very it's, hit and miss, big play. Obviously, it's skill because these are NFL players, but it was such a lucky bailout of just this crazy roll-around scramble and just bomb it down, and he got a touchdown that bailed out a game, and you know, which, I, I mean, is great. I don't think a lot of people were were playing him for some of those games with Blau. We were terrified. Uh, but it's, it speaks to your point that if he can get it done with a bad quarterback and Stafford is able to play a full season here with that bad back, shouldn't he be higher than I, I've got him at nine and I've, I, you know, I have a hard time moving him higher than that, but let's just compare him to the aforementioned, you know, the risks with Chris Godwin. And I start to think to myself, well, what's the upside of both of these guys? Whose ceiling is higher. And I think Galladay's ceiling is higher. And they both carry a little bit of risk, um, having been that, you know, I don't I don't think Galladay is really I don't think he's proven it yet. That's that's where I feel. Whereas whereas Chris Godwin last year proved it. And I know he finished as a good fantasy asset. What? Mike, turn, turn your head to this it? direction at the same time, Mike, right? Right here. This is where you need to be. That, and and that's that's what I feel. And so I, I realize he had eleven hundred and eleven, and so you say, "Well, he's done it. He's broken out." For some reason, when you know, when I watched the specific, you know, the way that it came, I just wasn't bought in. You, you had Marvin Jones missing a lot of time. Judge uh, Giamatti, Judge Giamatti, you know more uh, than any of us about the burden of proof. 
has Kenny Galladay provided <laughs> the burden of proof with a wide receiver six finish with half a Stafford? Oh, yeah. Oh, half- yeah. Just Matthew like Halford. a judge would say, oh, yeah. I love Kenny G. <laughs> so, I, so Stafford played through the Oakland game, so eight games. And up to that point, let's see what Kenny Galladay had, had done. Let's see. Uh, we got four games over 100 yards, uh, at least one touchdown in six of those games. Like Kenny Galladay's a beast, man. Just accept that. Let me try I, to like, change pretty, your mind I just, for a minute. It, you're blowing my mind. That's... Now, now we're having an argument I can get behind. Like Chris Godwin. That was that was just the first time we've really seen something from Chris, Chris Godwin. We've seen Kenny Galladay have multiple good seasons. Yeah, I mean, I, look, what you're saying is factual. It is not wrong. <laughs> that there's something in me that really has a hard time truly believing. You know, obviously, uh, you had three games missed from Marvin Jones. Um, yeah, I mean, which he, he was, by the way, worse without Marvin. He was better with him. I did. I did know that. Oh. I, did, I did actually. I did actually know that. Um, so, so I mean, look, strong arguments, and and you know, when we're talking through this and and getting a little deeper on the players, if I was on the board and I'm looking at you know Chris Godwin, <laughs> Chris Godwin behind Andy and uh, or Kenny Galladay behind Andy, I'm gonna take Kenny Galladay. So I need to adjust my rankings. So when you look at Galladay and you look at Evans and, and Godwin. Um, that's what I was going to bring up is kind of confidence levels on taking a Galladay alpha secure versus, you know, it's not like Evans wasn't an absolute beast and we can move on and kind of talk about them together for a second. Um, one, one last stat I want to remind people about with Kenny Galladay and we mentioned it in February, at the shocking stat show. He had a league high 13, 10 zone targets, 37, 20 plus yard targets. That's Pretty neat to be featured yes. in the big play capacity and the red zone, air yards and end zone targets. But I mean, he obviously you you have to right because he he had 116 targets, 65 receptions. So that's it's just why it's it's a little bit harder to bank on. But now you're talking about a Mike Evans type, so I think it's appropriate to compare those two players. Mike Evans, who is clearly he's broken out since his rookie year, has never had fewer than a thousand yards. is a is a red zone uh, monster. Um, so why, why is Kenny Galladay better? Is it solely because Brady is there and he's not going to throw the ball deep? I think I'll, I'll share my Evans thoughts and we've just seen Evans kind of transitioning in some capacity and it's probably the emergence of Godwin or just other targets in general. He's gone from 174 to 136 to 138 to 118 targets. He hasn't had that double-digit touchdown season that was kind of his calling card to begin his career in, I think he's three years, three straight years without doing that. Um, It just seems a little different to me. Wide receiver 18, then wide receiver 8, then wide receiver 12. Is Evans, have we seen Evans best? Let me ask you that. Have we seen the Mm. best of Mike Evans' career now? Last year, 67 for 11, 57, and 8. Fantasy wise, I, I wonder I, if we have. I think fantasy wise, statistic, you know, statistically speaking, yeah, I think his best season has been had because going forward, obviously Brady's getting older, then they're going to have to replace him with someone. Then he's lost his prime years. If it doesn't happen, say this year, I don't imagine that Mike Evans is going to beat those massive seasons he's had with thirteen hundred and twelve. Mike. <sighs> we're both very silent. I thought you were going to jump in. Yeah. There. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I I think we've probably seen the best Mike Evans season. Yeah, I mean, he's he's in. To be fair to him, he is entering that like what you consider for a wide receiver that prime age where they're you know twenty six to twenty eight years old because he's going to be twenty seven when the season starts. So it's possible that we haven't seen the best of him for fantasy purposes, though. I I, I are you happy with him as your have. one? That's another Mike question. Evans? Yeah, are you no. happy with Mike Evans as your wide receiver one? He's ranked eight. I mean, we're, we say all these things, and obviously he's a top 10 by consensus rankings and where he's going to finish, but is this another case of I'm no a little bit uncomfortable? You're not, yeah. Mike. Well, I, it doesn't help that the way that he went about, I mean, 
when, it was a weird the, ping pong ball of a season. Uh, he literally had a zero. He had a game where he didn't catch a single pass. That that seems unfathomable. Yeah, he, he shouldn't have done that. That was that <laughs> was not really nice. rude, man. That was not a nice thing to do. But I mean, it's, he started the season very very poorly. Then he had three out of four games where he was a monster, and then mixed in that sandwich was the game with no receptions. Then a number one finish, a number two finish, and then it was just meh from then on out before the injury derailed the end of the season. So that's maybe it's just last season impressions on me and I, i'm trying not to let that be the the influencer but i i just i don't feel comfortable with evans as my number one wide receiver no i i don't uh, i'll speak to this i i don't really like having my number one wide receiver be one of those 65 catch players whether it's galladay or evans i think the reason i'm i'm a little bit you know uh oh, over this offseason i've talked up mike evans is because i don't believe you'll have to draft him as that, I think people were burned last year um, by by how his fantasy production came um, and the the fact that he was now the number two on his team and now Brady coming. I think there will be a lot of things that push Mike Evans down where you can draft him as a two. And if I can have Mike Evans as a two, a big blow up potential with a high volume guy as my one, that's that's a strategy I would prefer. Whereas. Galladay, I I expect Galladay will be drafted ahead of Mike Evans, and you'll have to draft him as a one. I and I I'll speak for myself and I don't know how you guys felt. I know we went through and we gave early rankings individually up to probably wide receiver 40 or so when we built out our consensus rankings. I felt like there was even more of a disparity from the very top to the question marks surrounding guys from about 5 or 6 on. Because you're talking about um, you know, if Evans is in that variable category with Brady coming on board, you know, Galladay, low reception totals. We're going to talk about two more guys today. Amari Cooper, who I know Mike has his... <laughs> Mike has his questions. Yeah. We all have our questions. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous to say just Mike because Cooper went from the wide receiver three in the first 10 weeks to the wide receiver 43 over the last six weeks. But even DJ Moore sitting at 10 on our consensus rankings, that's where you start to see us individually uh, have a wider range of opinion about these guys. I just feel like I have a little less confidence in the in the upper echelon wide receivers this year than I did last year. Am I, I alone? I, no, no. I had the exact – you're speaking my thoughts as I went through and ranked these guys. Once you got to – Eight, nine, ten. It was it was one of those things where I was looking at wide receiver sixteen, seventeen, going, man, who would I take here? You know, it, it, a, a wide range of guys saying this guy could be better than DJ Moore. Um, but eventually, you've got to you've got to rank them. Um, and, yeah, it's probability. You know, That's what the rankings do. Yeah. So you know, when we talk about Amari Cooper, um, you know, everyone wants to know how low does Mike have him ranked because Mike <laughs> is not a believer, but Mike is going to say the hundred percent right thing. I'll, I'll see the floor um, as he <laughs> sees the argument of where he's got him ranked. I have Amari Cooper at 10 because I it, just like last year, I concede the fact that Amari Cooper will probably in the final rankings be a top 10 wide receiver. He might be a little bit higher, Every single year, uh, I mean, and these, it was really funny to see another analyst uh, express these thoughts. And then uh, he may, maybe he took it too far on Twitter, got really, really mad at did him. You, did you, you didn't just call uh, Rex Ryan an analyst, did you? I did. Oh, what okay. Would you, what would you call him? I don't Former know. A, coach. Re a, a Rex Ryan? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, he's in his own like uh, <laughs> subspecies or something. We have a host, we have an analyst. Here's Rex Ryan. That's right. And he's <laughs> that's, awesome. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm look, I'm not he, all what did he do? He called him a turd. Yeah. He did How many do times that. do we call guys turds on this show every day? It's, it's a lot. And by guys I mean Adam Gaze. <laughs> but Whoa. Hey, we he's just the creator somebody. of turds. <laughs> oh no. He, he creates oh, fantasy no. turds. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about, Mr. Yeah, Behold. I guess he really yes. does. Yes. It's wow. all coming together. But so it was very, very interesting to see someone on TV 
kind of sharing the the same thoughts where Amari Cooper is excellent for half a year. He disappears for the sec for maybe not just the second half, but it, a half of the year he disappears, and it happens every single year. And there is an excuse every single year. I'm done for with Amari the excuses. Cooper. I'm done with the excuses. That's Are what, you? all right. Yeah, I am because he will have a very strong season. I have him at eight. He will finish there, but it will not be without pain. It will not be without suffering. That is the Amari Cooper experience. And if anything, Rex Ryan pointed out the truth that he did it in two different places. And now he's right. been paid a huge amount of money. And I tried to make the excuse for him when we talked about him a couple of weeks ago and just saying, well, it's hard to look at his performances against top cornerbacks because the you know they don't target the top cornerbacks. That's not what I don't make that excuse for other great wide receivers. <laughs> and what's what's really hard I about I just don't get it. That's the truth. I don't get it. Nobody I don't does. understand how you can dominate on a level no that, one understands that it. puts you at number three or number two or number six or number four on a given week, and then you can evaporate into the air like a mist. No, no one can explain it, and you compound that with the fact that a wide receiver on his team had a, what about eighty fewer yards and two fewer touchdowns, and that that's what separated Michael Gallup and Amari Cooper. And we're not even considering ranking Michael Gallup here in the top fifteen. Yeah, you're, we're not. We're not considering that, but but their production was very, very, very similar. Well, Amari did deal with injury, and, and so, so did Michael let, Gallup. Let, Michael Gallup did that in fourteen games. Yeah, but Amari me, Cooper's going to make a hundred million dollars, right? Yes, a hundred million. <laughs> uh, here's here's the thing about Amari Cooper. Yes, he he disappeared for half the time he was in Oakland. We remember he was traded in 2018 to the Cowboys, and when he was a Cowboy. He never really disappeared. I mean, he had, you know, one bad game. All wide receivers. Because he had already them, disappeared for the first half. Like, he had sure. already done it. Sure. You could say he already did it, and he's got some magical quota of disappearing. <laughs> but he was a cowboy, and in those eight games, he was dominant. He was on a 1,300-yard, 11-touchdown pace. Great every game. Then he comes in the next season and looks like the guy that they traded for and dominates. And then he gets injured and sucks. You know, in Oakland, it was always like a, which game is he going to show up? You can never guess. But I, the way that I look at it, and, I, you know, it is hard to apologize for a guy year after year after year for the same thing. But I actually, I, I think he's been consistent with the Cowboys until he was injured. And so if he, if that was the issue and he comes out and plays great, Amari Cooper could very easily be someone we're talking about in the upper, upper echelon as... I, I mean, but I, it, I it totally feels like understand. he will just find a new issue. That's yeah. the what he's no, chosen to do. And Brooks brought up, you know, maybe he truly can't play through injuries like other elite wide receivers do. Maybe he's active on game day, but he can't play through them the same way. Maybe the team had him go out there and, and be a distraction. Maybe, 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 but maybe he's got a twin and the twins, not very talented. <laughs> and the it's twin like a, has to come in and they switch the, the prestige. They switch the glasses, there's, and then the two twin goes in there. It's the oh, long con. is that what's going on? Yes, that's what it's I'm the saying. prestige, man. Here, here's the deal. You want to talk about his twin? Fantasy-wise, success-wise, oh, no. you take Michael Crabtree, you take Michael Gallup. You take the number two uh, because they come cheaper, and they're more consistent. They're better fantasy options back in Oakland and here with the Cowboys. I mean, Gallup won't cost you anything that Cooper costs you. And he won't be far off. So it's I, so I, you're you're probably right. And it's so how I would have approached it if he had not just been paid like a hundred bazillion dollars. Yeah, like that is distorting my view a little bit, which is the, you know narrative, not production. But the two the total snapshot here of Amari Cooper and his twin, week five, two hundred twenty six <laughs> yards a touchdown. Week six, three yards, three yeah, yards. That's that's uh, not as week, many. Week seven, 106. <laughs> How does that happen? If you are in a if you are a hundred million dollar wide receiver, how can that ever happen? Well, he wasn't a hundred million dollar man yet. Hey, that's a fair point. Now it's it gonna happened. it's all gonna get fixed. <laughs> hey, why, why aren't you talking about this with Mike Evans? I mean, he had the zero, so 
Isn't he, you know, a disappearing act? That's that's what we were saying. Is if I, you do like, that I'm for multiple Evans, years, my one. Yeah, if you do that for multiple years at a time, then you start to get people calling you a turd. <laughs> that's what happens. All right, DJ Moore. We'll close out our top ten consensus rankings. DJ Moore. This illustrates the point Jason and I were talking about. DJ Moore sits at ten. I have him at thirteen. Jason twelve. Mike nine. DJ Moore sits at ten with Teddy Bridgewater coming in at quarterback, a new offense, a new coach. That tells you the landscape, I think, you know, exists right now at wide receiver. He's ranked at 10. He had a solid season, but in 15 games, was the wide receiver 18 last year? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're always trying to so get that guy's a at guy's... 10? You're trying to get a guy's blow up before it happens. Obviously, if you got Chris Godwin last year... You were really ecstatic about that, but if you pay for Chris Godwin this year, well, he has to replicate that, and maybe, and you know, and and he hopefully will. But you're not getting that discount. Whereas, I feel like dropping him lower than what I have him right now. Just thinking about this, because so, right now, DJ Moore, wide receiver, 18 last year, has a new quarterback, a new offense, and Robbie Anderson involved in the offense. Well, that's I'll, the current state of affairs. I'll give the floor to Mike. You've got him inside your top ten. Uh, I certainly see the talent, but what, talk up DJ Moore. Well, he I mean, he did that with four touchdowns, and he did that in essentially 14 games because, the unfortunately, in championship week, if you remember, he got knocked out of the game right at the very, very beginning. So his production was only in 14 games where he was nearly 12, 1,200 yards and four touchdowns, and that was with horrifically bad quarterback play. Like, he, he still got it done those first couple of weeks, with Cam Newton, when where Cam did not look like was throwing the be, tomahawks. <laughs> yes, he should not be on an NFL field. And then the other trash that started playing quarterback, he still got it done as well. On top of that, he was 22 years old last year when he was getting those things done. Like I, I believe in the breakout age. DJ Moore, we we talked about it all the time, but he was. Our favorite prospect that year, his his athletic measurables are off the chart. His production profile was off the chart. He was the first wide receiver taken in that draft. And we saw this was like last year was the breakout. And to say he has a, a new quarterback, true. But his, quarter, but his quarterback is way better now. His quarterback is far more accurate. And his DJ Moore's skill set of being able to take a short slant sure. to the house – that matches up totally with what Teddy Bridgewater is comfortable doing, and that's not to say DJ Moore can't stretch the field because he's really fast. Like Car Carolina threw the ball the sec second most in the NFL last year. The yeah, arrow, and now you're bringing in you're bringing in a college coach, so it, I I think the arrow. But is what about way what about up. the the Robbie Anderson factor? You think that is he, are you counting on touchdowns to jump up for DJ Moore? Because yes, because I don't know if you're going to see. I mean, do you think he's a 90-catch guy next year? Uh, Yeah. He was at 87 in 14 games. So, yeah, I would definitely put him over the 90 reception mm. mark. I think he hits at least six receiving touchdowns. And Robbie Anderson, to me, just makes the team better. Like If you have, you have Curtis Samuel and Robbie Anderson stretching the field and opening things up, like DJ Moore is going to be in the middle of the field all by himself. You know what's, well, what's ahead, crazy? Jay. Well, I was just going to say, you know, we, we it's a matter some sometimes these rankings when I have a guy low and it's like, man, I've got him way lower is not about just him, yeah, it's and that's about fair. the other guys that go ahead. But there is a name that we are not talking about on this episode. We'll get to him uh quickly on the next episode that I'm sure some people are out there going, "What? Where's the superstar? Where is the uh, the catch? Where is he?" He's not oh, in our top yeah. ten. Yeah, he's not. Yeah, I. You know, look, DJ Morris. You bring up a good point about his age. You bring up a good point. Obviously, you hope for more efficiency from Teddy Bridgewater, but it is hope. Teddy Bridgewater has not su supplied fantasy value to very many players in his career, and he also never had a contract like he's on right now. The old Amari yeah. Cooper theory. Yeah, but qu yeah, qu quarterback contracts did not produce uh, the greatest things for you know <laughs> the Mike Glennons of the world. But um, 
I just think there's a lot of question marks around DJ uh, yeah. Moore. I don't and think that's fine. I think his range of outcomes are not all up. I don't think it's all up for DJ Moore as a potential outcome. I obviously have him at 13, so I still like the season, but it illustrates the fact that there is a lot of variability, and I cannot. I'm going to have a hard time drafting a player like DJ Moore over somebody like T.Y. Hilton. Well, then you're going to be. That's going to be a tough thing. You're going to be looking at your fantasy opponent, and DJ Moore is going to be in that lineup. And then Coach Jaw is going to let you know what's coming. Murder. I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. Again, footclanhelp.com for our AMA tomorrow. Make sure you head over there, and uh, we'll catch you later. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers. And Foot Clan, we also want to thank Pristine Auction. Heck go yeah. To, go to pristineauction.com right now. Do it. Do it. Go. Go. I'm there. Use okay. the registration code BALLERS. Okay. BALLERS. Simple to remember. You get a $10 credit. And listen, a Devontae Adams signed jersey yesterday, $73. $73. Hundreds of daily auctions. Many of these fine wide receivers find their apparel at pristineauction.com. And you can pick up a signed... Uh, Mike can get his DJ Moore jersey. Let's say you, you can get like a top 10 guy like DJ That's Moore. Right. Pristineauction.com. Use the code BALLERS. Get a $10 credit. Pristineauction.com.